Oceans cover more than 70% of Earth's surface, shaping our climate, regulating weather, storing carbon, and providing food and livelihoods to billions of people. They are the very lungs of our planet, quietly absorbing carbon dioxide, producing oxygen, and keeping Earth habitable, yet beneath their glittering surface. A silent crisis is unfolding, one that is stripping life away from vast stretches of ocean at an alarming rate. These are the dead zones, places where oxygen levels plummet so low that fish, crabs, and most other forms of marine life suffocate. Leaving behind underwater wastelands, once rare, these hypoxic zones have spread like a creeping shadow across the globe, growing in both size and number, and today's scientists have identified more than 600 dead zones worldwide. Some are as small as a few square kilometers, while others stretch tens of thousands across coastal waters. What's more disturbing is that both human activity and climate change are accelerating their expansion, transforming some of the world's richest marine habitats into graveyards. At the heart of this crisis lies nutrient pollution, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, which spill into rivers and coastlines from farms, factories, and cities. Fertilizers used to feed the world's crops wash into rivers, carrying nutrients downstream until they pour into the sea. Wastewater discharge and industrial effluents add to this cocktail, triggering explosive algal blooms when they reach coastal waters. At first, these blooms may look harmless, even beautiful, painting the sea with streaks of green or red. But when the algae die, they sink to the seabed, where bacteria break them down in a process that consumes massive amounts of oxygen. The result is suffocating water with so little oxygen that marine life either flees or dies. Fish float lifeless to the surface. Shellfish smother in their shells and bottom-dwelling creatures vanish altogether. What remains is an underwater desert where only a few hardy species like jellyfish and certain microbes thrive, replacing one's diverse ecosystems with monocultures of survivalists. Nowhere is this problem more evident than in the Gulf of Mexico. Fed by the mighty Mississippi River, which drains much of the American Midwest. The Gulf has become home to one of the largest recurring dead zones on Earth, each summer. Fertilizers washed from farms thousands of kilometers inland funnel into the Gulf, fueling algal blooms that later collapse into suffocating hypoxia. In some years, the dead zone has stretched over 20,000 square kilometers, an area roughly the size of New Jersey. The ecological and economic consequences are staggering. Shrimp, a cornerstone of the Gulf's seafood industry, are forced to migrate away from loxygen waters, reducing catches and forcing fishers to travel further offshore at higher costs. Commercial fisheries, coastal businesses, and seafood supply chains all feel the pinch, while local communities whose livelihoods depend on these waters face devastating uncertainty. And this isn't just an ecological problem, it's an economic one that reverberates through industries, from seafood processors to tourism operators costing billions each year. But the Gulf of Mexico is far from alone. The Baltic Sea, bordered by multiple countries, is one of the most oxygen-deprived seas in the world. Agricultural runoff, coupled with limited water circulation, has left vast swaths of the seabed lifeless. In the Black Sea, hypoxia once killed off nearly all bottom-dwelling life until international cooperation reduced nutrient inputs, though the ecosystem has never fully recovered. Closer to the United States, Chesapeake Bay, America's largest estuary regularly experiences summer dead zones that choke one of the nation's most iconic blue crab fisheries. Even the East China Sea, fed by the nutrient-rich Yangtze River, has seen massive hypoxic events linked to both agricultural and industrial discharges. The message is clear. This is not an isolated phenomenon, but a global crisis that respects no borders. Even once pristine regions are now vulnerable as climate change and human activity collide to spread hypoxia into waters once thought safe. Climate change acts as an accelerant to this underwater disaster. Warmer oceans hold less dissolved oxygen, meaning that even without pollution, marine ecosystems face suffocation. Stratification where warm surface waters sit atop cooler, deeper waters further reduces mixing and oxygen replenishment in the depths. Meanwhile, intense storms and floods supercharged by climate change, wash even more nutrients into rivers, superfeeding algal blooms. Rising seas reshape coastlines, altering water circulation patterns and making ecosystems more fragile. 
In short, climate change is loading the dice against marine life, turning seasonal dead zones into permanent ones and threatening to expand hypoxia into deeper offshore waters that were once beyond its reach. The ecological consequences of expanding dead zones are catastrophic. Marine food webs unravel as oxygen vanishes. Tiny plankton, shrimp, and juvenile fish perish first, stripping the base of the food chain. Larger predators like cod, tuna, and dolphins either starve or are forced to migrate, creating cascading effects throughout the ecosystem. Coral reefs and seagrass meadows adjacent to hypoxic waters also suffer, weakening biodiversity further. In many cases, the vacuum left by disappearing species is filled by jellyfish, which thrive in loxygen environments and outcompete fish for food. Entire ecosystems shift toward these oxygen-tolerant creatures, fundamentally altering the balance of life in the sea. Biodiversity loss also weakens vital ecosystem services. Natural water filtration, carbon storage, and storm protection provided by healthy marine systems are all diminished, leaving coastal communities more vulnerable than ever. The human toll is equally grim. Fisheries collapse, tourism declines, and coastal economies unravel under the weight of hypoxic seas. For small fishing communities, the economic blow is not just numbers on a chart, it's dinner on the table, jobs for families, and futures for children. In places like the Gulf of Mexico or parts of Southeast Asia where millions rely on fish for protein and livelihood, dead zones are more than environmental threats, they are human crises. Recreational industries, from sport fishing to diving tourism, also suffer. As the once vibrant ocean becomes barren and lifeless, as catches decline and costs rise, fishers are often forced to target new species, sometimes depleting those as well, creating a vicious cycle of ecological stress and economic hardship. Yet despite the gravity of the situation, solutions do exist. Tackling nutrient pollution is the first and most effective step. Agricultural reforms such as precision fertilization, buffer strips along rivers, and planting cover crops can drastically reduce nutrient runoff. Restoring wetlands acts as nature's filter, trapping nutrients before they reach the ocean, upgrading wastewater treatment plants, and enforcing stricter regulations on industrial discharges also play a critical role. In some regions, these strategies have shown promising results. For instance, Targeted nutrient reductions in the Chesapeake Bay have begun to shrink its dead zone, proving that coordinated human intervention can make a measurable difference. Still, progress requires persistence, funding, and above all, cooperation across borders and sectors. Technology is emerging as a powerful ally in the fight against hypoxia. Satellites now help track algal blooms from space, while autonomous underwater vehicles armed with oxygen sensors patrol the depths in real time. Predictive modeling powered by artificial intelligence allows scientists to forecast where and when dead zones will develop, giving policymakers time to act. Experimental approaches, such as pumping oxygen-rich water into hypoxic zones, show limited but intriguing results, though scaling them globally remains a challenge. Meanwhile, citizen science programs are enlisting everyday people to monitor water quality, turning the fight against dead. Zones into a shared responsibility rather than a niche scientific pursuit education campaigns, documentaries, and global initiatives like the United Nations Sustainable Development. Goals are also pushing the issue into public consciousness, highlighting the urgent need for collective action. At the international level, cooperation is critical. Shared waters like the Baltic Sea or East China Sea cannot be restored by one country alone. Only through regional partnerships, shared data, and joint policies can progress be made. The success of the Rhine River cleanup in Europe, where nutrient discharges were significantly reduced through multinational cooperation, stands as proof that collective action can turn the tide. But the scale of today's crisis demands even more ambitious global commitments. Linking ocean health to climate policies, food systems, and sustainable development. In the end, dead zones are not just an environmental story, they are a warning. They tell us that the way we farm, the way we build, the way we consume, and the way we live all ripple outward, reaching even the farthest corners of the sea. They remind us that oceans are not limitless dumping grounds, but fragile ecosystems woven into the very fabric of life on Earth. The spread of hypoxia, 
is a test of humanity's ability to learn from mistakes, to innovate, and to act before it is too late. Because if the oceans die, life as we know it on land will not be far behind. The good news is that we still have a chance to act through science. Policy, technology, and collective will to shrink dead zones, restore marine life, and preserve the ocean's role as Earth's life support system. For more fact-checked updates on ocean health environmental crises and global solutions, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. The ocean's story is our story, and it's one we cannot afford to ignore.